Can we start in English, if that's okay? No, that's okay. So good day to everyone. Welcome on the channel. Today I'll be interviewing Bas van Os, same last name, similar DNA. He is my father and I think he's an interesting person. So we're going to get to know him. Um, so why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? What do you do? What are you interested in? That's the, the big question. What defines me is very simple. Um, I love Jesus. That's what defines me. What I do is quite difficult because I do a lot of different stuff. At the moment, I am doing a little bit of training, management consulting, uh, coaching, um, local politics, uh, writing, that kind of stuff. What do you write about? Because I know this is what you find most most interesting right now. Well, I'm now writing a... Um, I work together with Lance Bovenberg, who is an economist of some fame in the Netherlands. And um, he's interested in my theology. Um, and I'm interested in his econ economics. And what we do is um, we have taught a minor in Rotterdam University, Erasmus, uh, about um, relational economics, values and leadership. And now just last week we were in Belgium for a conference um, where we actually showed what kind of model of, of a person, of a human decision maker, um, we sort of come up, came up with in order to, to go into economic game theory and better explain what's happening than current economic models do. So in a word... Um, we are using old wisdom from theology and philosophy and also evolution to improve the model of the human being that economics use and then mm. get to a better understanding of how humans come to cooperation or not. Excellent. So that's going to be the next book. So what is your academic background? Because I uh, know you mentioned theology, but I think you've also got some other um yeah some other things that you've worked on i started with industrial engineering and management science at the university of eindhoven yeah and that day that was still called being an engineer mm -hmm. nowadays it's called the masters of business administration but that's that's how it works uh and then i went into um pricewaterhouse coopers where i was supposed to pick up my uh business economics and I did. And then I moved on to theology, where I did my dissertation on the Gospel of Philip, which is a um, Coptic document. It's written in the Egyptian language of late antiquity. Uh, and it is a Gnostic Christian document, which means it is a particular kind of Christianity that is expressed in there, um, which later became a heresy. So... That's an interesting one. And then um, I did my uh, novel writing at uh, Middlesex University, Where's that? Uh, which, which was a course, uh, a distant learning course. Oh, okay. Um, and very interesting. Um, and on the side, I did uh, as much as I could on psychology. Interesting. And I was... It's a bit of more of a specific question because I'm learning. Oh yeah, sorry, I it, forgot something. Oh yeah, go ahead. I also did a um, uh, at the Free University in Amsterdam. I did part of the master course for uh, executive coaching. You did part of it, so you took a couple yes, of classes. Yes, the, the two parts of it. Uh, one part is the individual coaching, and the other part is the group coaching. And I did the individual one. Okay, so just understanding the timeline, you started off with the industrial engineering when you were yep. a teenager or? Yeah, 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 when I was 17. So you thought, I have to make money first to start a family. And I then... came out of the um, um, difficult 80s yeah. when there was mass unemployment. Mm -hmm. and I came from a family that was, um, uh, how should I say, down to earth 
my father uh, started off as a as an uh, air force pilot became a plumber started his own business and started to do uh, um central heating systems mm -hmm. when he came back from from canada they, they, he was in canada for a while and that's how i grew up so um doing industrial engineering and uh, management science sounded like a good idea at the time and it wasn't or it never had my heart yeah so it's still a good idea i've learned a lot mm -hmm. and, um uh, i can help companies and it's a good basis but um but it never had my heart you know there was a day when they had invited a certain uh, Dutch gentleman who had been swindling large parts of the population with the American land program. Um, supposedly, they would buy um, uh, land around the railway connections in the United States yeah. and would make a heck of a profit. And of course, that collapsed and he got off scot free and still became rich, although all the people who invested in him did not. And my um, study, how do you call that, association, study association university, yeah. invited him to talk about this inspiring example of how you can become rich. And I really felt rotten when that was going on. So I stayed at home and I read a, a psalm. I was very interested into, uh, in the Psalms of David. And I read a psalm about uh, what righteousness is uh, and that a righteous man gives himself to others and uh, is blessed in that. So, yeah, it never had my heart. Rich in a different way. Rich in a different way, yes. That's good. Okay, so industrial engineering didn't have your heart. Then you went on to work, I guess, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> at many different jobs. And when did you actually start doing theology? Like, what age were you? Ah, <clears throat> that was... So I was born in 1967. 67. And um, I... Um, I had a nice career with PricewaterhouseCoopers and continued for the government doing larger infrastructure projects, transport, public transport projects. And then I was uh, making friends and enemies. And one of the groups that opposed me was the Dutch Railways. And I was offered a position as... Um, as uh, co-CEO of uh, the Dutch um, transport card, transport ticketing system. Yeah. I was blocked by the railways because of what had happened in the past when, uh, when I was negotiating on behalf of the government with them. And that was in 2004 or three. And then in 2004, I um, uh, enrolled into a PhD program at the University of Groningen to uh, to do uh, the dissertation on the Gospel of Philip, which I finished in 2007. But did you have to do uh, a bachelor or master before that or no? In theology? No. no? no I needed to show a proof of um, capability. So I wrote something that you could call a master thesis. Ah. And they read that and they thought it was very good. What was it? What was it about? On the Gospel of Philip. Ah, uh, this was your... No, no, that was the first one. So I, uh, I had attended a group of philosophers and theologians. <laughs> and, and at one point in time, there was a presentation on the Gospel of Philip. Now, remember, I was a bit of a weird kid in university. So I read these Gnostic documents when they uh, became available. Uh, and I didn't understand a word of it, but I read them out loud. So that was my way of learning. Just helps. read all the stuff out loud before you understand anything i think you did something like that uh, except you listen to it but but yeah. just read it before even before understanding anything just read it so i had read all this stuff and one thing that uh, impressed itself on me was that there was some level of coherence in that document even though i could not grasp it and then I listened to this talk about the Gospel of Philip, and that was done on the basis of a recent study that said there is no coherence. It's just a notebook where um, disparate ideas have been jotted down and um, for remembering them. 
And I thought, that's not true. So I went into it and I worked my ass off uh, over the Christmas holidays to produce that master thesis in, I think, a month's time or something. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, I submitted it. And they were quite happy uh, um, in a personal capacity. So it wasn't part of a formal training uh, or anything, but the professors were quite happy. And they said, well, that's a pretty good master's thesis. Is it what I read or was that after? No, no, no. This was a, um, this was a shorter document. Yeah. Um, and then later on, when it became a, a doctoral dissertation, um, that book, that's the one that you've read. Okay. Now, on the Gnostics, what are your disagreements with them? I was wondering. Well, first you have to understand what Gnosticism is. Yeah, sorry. I always go ahead because we've had these conversations before. So I'm trying to learn something new, but I guess we have to take a step back. So why don't you explain what Gnosticism is? Okay, most most Christians think Gnosticism is something weird and and, and ugly. Uh, Some people have called it uh, Platonism on uh, steroids. Um. You could say that, but that's the perception of mainstream Christianity towards this this deviant uh, group. Um, What is essential in Gnostic Christianity is that it actually accepts all of Christianity. Not in the way that some people like um, Dan Brown have said that it's a more human Jesus. No, not at all. It's a more divine Jesus that they proclaim. And a more divine Jesus, you have to understand because of the way that they look at God. They see religion as an oppressive system. So most gods are false gods. All gods, in fact, are false gods except for the highest father. And the false gods keep humanity enslaved in in service of the systems uh, that be, the structures. So the Roman gods, the Jewish god, all the gods sort of conspire together to keep people oppressed. Just like people now talk about systemic racism or capitalism or what have you, all kinds of systems that um, keep people oppressed. And they say, well, they say it's such a wonderful thing, but it's not. And in in view of the Gnostic Christians, they became awake. They use that word just like the woke generation now uses the word woke. They became awake by getting knowledge, gnosis, gnosis means knowledge, of that higher um realm beyond the visible realm the stars and the planets that 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 represent the gods of this cosmos and if you get to know that higher realm which can either be spatial that means going up beyond the cosmos or it can be inward psychological which means you go into yourself beyond the gods that be um if you can connect with that then you get transformed and you are reborn that's basically their thesis are the is the spatial method as well as the psychological method pointing toward the same realm or are they different do they yes, have different it's the same thing well in the gospel of philip it's the same thing i don't know whether all gnostic christians were as sophisticated as okay. the gospel of philip. because from what i understand of gnosticism which is not a lot is that they don't really have one coherent idea in other words, there are different Gnostics that have different, let's say, doctrines, and it's kind of... I just gave you the one coherent idea, and the rest is all depending on the group that you're talking with. So there's different... There's so the, different Gnostic, the, 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 the coherent idea is that this world is a corrupted world because there's death and there's sickness and there is oppression. Yeah. And therefore, the divine must be something else than that what rules this world. That is the overarching idea and you become a Gnostic Christian if you believe that Jesus Christ is the one who came from that higher realm to make people to awake people here and bring them into that higher realm then you are a Gnostic Christian I hear you. The first part is Gnostic there is something to know beyond the current cosmos and the second part is Gnostic Christianity and sometimes um, because we do not always know whether all these writings that we now call Gnostic Christians were not Jewish Christian, Jewish Gnostics or what have you. Sometimes people say, well, let's call it biblical demiurgenism. And that would mean something like there is a creator God lower than the highest father yeah, responsible say. for the present creation. And he is either 
stupid or malevolent, but he is definitely of a lower order and less perfect than the highest father. Okay. And then you've got all kinds of different systems. Yeah, yeah. So but that's part of the Gnostic idea. The Gnostic idea is that you can speculate. <laughs> so it, don't when you read a Gnostic writing, don't immediately believe that they would die on a uh, pyre of fire uh, because of the exact description there. It, yeah. One of the, 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 the beautiful things is that they say, well, you, we're talking about stuff that we, we don't know, so we can speculate. Okay. Do you have significant disagreements with the Gnostic, the, the Gnostic Christians, let's say? Well, the point is um, that they basically say the other Christians do not know this highest God and are therefore worshipping false gods. I think that's not a good starting point to have a discussion. Do you think the it's false, point, what they say? I, th I think that's false. Okay, yeah. great. Because yeah. They, 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 they make a clear distinction between the gods that are being worshipped, the Jesus that's being worshipped, the Holy Spirit that's being worshipped, the Father that's being worshipped by ordinary Christians, and their secret that they have discovered. Mm. Those as far that they would say that the God of Genesis, the God of the Jews, um, is a false God. Mm. Uh, it goes as far that they would say that the creation is not good in itself. Yeah, the body is not good in itself. And so, if you if you let all those things come to you, you say, well, that's that's not my Christianity. My Christianity is a very embodied Christianity. Okay, thank you. What is your what is the second point that you wanted to make about it, the Gnostics? Yeah, I said you said first, and then I thought you had a second. Yeah, the second one was that the uh, they they then denounced the God of the Jews, the yeah. uh, okay. God of Genesis. And the point there is there is something you could understand. I do not want to be an anti-Semitic here, but I'm gonna um, defend their point of view. Okay, yeah. so I'm advocating on their behalf now. Um, there had been three wars, the, the Great War with Rome, in which the temple was uh, destroyed in the year 70, but also a subsequent war, which raged in uh, on Cyprus, in Egypt, in Syria, um, that was the Kitos War, uh, around 115. And then, of course, the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was in 130, 134. So he had three major revolts started by Jewish forces that threatened a lot of people. We have letters from Egypt uh, that say, my son, my son, I have I've not heard from you in months. Where are you? Did the Jews get you? I mean, so there was fear in the population. And the idea that a God that would encourage that kind of violence was a false God. That's not a weird idea. No. So that's what I'm saying on their behalf. Yeah. Okay. How do you personally deal with with evil, with war? Because um, given your conviction, you would say that the creation is good. How do you deal with all the evil that's, that's being... Uh, that's the huge problem, of course. Um, this is what we call the, the, the justification of God. How can you believe in a God? How can you believe that God would be something perfect if this is not perfect? Um, for me, I deal with that on a relational level. So if I have pain, I deal with it by being in the proximity of God, not by asking God to um, miraculously take away the pain. Although people have prayed for me and I always let them, I don't, I don't have a problem with that and I would pray myself. But basically I say, oh Lord, this hurts. So the corruptibility of this place is something that I share with God rather than that I would make him responsible or see him as a panacea to solve all problems here. You never ask God to fix your problems? Not really, no. No, I ask for God to be... I basically talk with God all the time. So I view the world with the perception that I have of God and I'm in relationship and communion with that. And that sort of changes what I can do and sort of correct some of my moods, <laughs> as you know, 
Yes. I can be moody. <laughs> as, as we all can be. And it helps me tremendously to to then uh, go into the spirit and, and look with God's eyes of love to the people and the world around me. And that is for me uh, being both in heaven and on earth at the same time. Mm-hmm. And that's very much Gospel of Philip. So, yes, I'm still very positive about Gospel of Philip, even though I'm not a Gnostic Christian. <laughs> okay, that's really good. That's really good. I would like to quickly talk about your children because you have quite a few. How many do you have? We have six children. Which one is the best? (laughs) No, just kidding. Um, It's a question you've asked before, you know? Yeah, I know. I've asked it many times. It's just uh, want to hear my name one day. No. um, So why six? What's the deal? Uh, we wanted four, and we couldn't count. There we go. Still, four is quite an ambitious number, or was it more normal um, in your mind? Well, my parents had six. Yeah, Inga's parents had six, even though one of them died. Um, so four sounded like a, a nice modern conservative reasonable. number. Very reasonable. <laughs> No, it's 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 you don't know whether or not you will be able to have children. Remember, uh, we were having children when a lot of people who couldn't have children didn't have ways and means to to make that happen. So you're you're far less cocky about it. Yeah. Um, so yes, children are a gift, but in a, in our case, the gift came easy. Mm. Easily. All right. Easily. What age were you when you had your first child? I always have to calculate that kind of stuff. You were actually, let me do it for you. I think you were 1995. 28, 28, no, 20, 27. Yeah, 27, because I still had my birthday to come in October. Yeah, that's true. So 27, we had Mirte. Yeah. And that was the most miraculous event of my life. So how did sorry, that, you, how did that change you? Number one. So you, um, <laughs> the, the whole idea that you can hold someone that can do nothing in return and that you hold it without any condition sort of made me feel connected to everyone on this planet and to God. So I was really walking across. We were living in Johannesburg in South Africa at the time. And um, we had found a printer to use the Dutch, um, to honor the Dutch tradition of sending out birth cards when, 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 when someone is born. Um, so I, I was walking across the copy, as they say in Afrikaans, and uh, I was seeing all these people of all these different beautiful colors that they have in South Africa. And I was thinking, oh, you either are parents or you have been a child with parents holding you like that. And I was really in a pink cloud, yeah, uh, understanding something of the deep, deep love that parents can have for their newborn children and that that is something that connects virtually all healthy human beings around the world. And then I thought, this is how my parents stood with me, and this is how God stood with us at the birth of creation. Mm. I was overwhelmed by the experience. So that's agape. That is agape, or you can use different words, but yes, that is love to a degree that I had not known before. Wow. So your first one, it was an effort. You didn't have the same effect with the subsequent children or was it just something that you you received? One mingle. I don't know what happened with whom. No, no, really. Do you think it was difficult if you have six children to sometimes separate the stories that belong to each and every one of them? Yeah. Um, But the first experience, perhaps people who are less monogamous know that your first love, you never forget. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> that was Mirte. And, of course, uh, then came Aaron here in, uh, in, in, in Leuste. We live in Leuste. That is yeah. in the middle of the Netherlands. And Aaron had a difficult birth. So um, we, we come from a tradition of home births. But he had to go, or Inge had to go, my wife Inge, had to go into the hospital. And because of all these nice speed bumps that are now on roads, that was very, very painful. Mm. 
And then, of course, she came into the hospital. The child was born. I, as a father, I had this beautiful experience in in South Africa where we were sort of a team, the two of us, with just a midwife. Um, and now there was a far bigger team with far more experienced people, etc., that took over. And um, yeah, that was the uh, experience of having a child being born in a hospital. Mm. Very, very different and coming home alone um, because of the partial home birth here. The um, the house was a mess, <laughs> so I started cleaning. And then next day I went into the hospital and I said, they're coming home. And they said, no, 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 it can't be, can't be done. I said, why not? Oh, this, this temperature is slightly higher. I said, hospital has far more risks for a young child than at home. So tell me what we need to do. And then they said, well, if you can get a nurse to, to check on you at home, then you can bring him home. So we arranged a nurse to check on us and we brought him home. And uh, finally, things were as they should be again. That's good. So Aaron is... Um... He's also in this little corner for anyone who's watching. And you had a, I think you had a talk with him and Paul van der Klei. Yes. I think so yes, I'll put that did. in the description if you want to see uh, what that baby is doing now. Um, that's exciting. And um, I won't go into every birth, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how do you look back on, on all of this? Because you know, you've now raised six children. How, what are the feelings that come up for you? Was it very difficult? Um, any things that stand out to you? Well, um, you know, the statistics tell you that parents are less happy. Yeah. So people tell you get children and you'll be more happy. And it's not true if you ask uh, people on a survey whether or not that's true. And uh, people will say, well, I, I struggle, I sleep too little, I'm, I have far less money to expend, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. And uh, things can go horribly long, wrong with your children. So you've got concerns, et cetera. For me, it was a very, very, is a very, very positive experience. I have the feeling that I can live several lives at the same time. Just like I just told you that I have the feeling that I live on earth and in heaven. Um, it's also so that that being part of the lives of your children for, in as much as they let you is so incredibly rich. And especially when they also have loved ones, the the the, the richness multiplies. And because you love them, you and if if it is a nice world and on balance here in the Netherlands, it's a very nice world. Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, you get to enjoy a lot of their joys. Of course, you also share the sorrows, but that only adds to the depth of the relationship. So, yeah, that's that's wonderful. So you can be in the spirit together with people you love so much and that you are intimately connected with. That's that's a richness that I can't describe. Mm. That's beautiful. Given the time that we have, I'd actually like to, for you to speak about your tripartite um Maybe not your idea, but the one you've spoken about a lot in your work and to me, um, which is body, soul, and spirit, I would say. Yeah, that's interesting. I think if you have, if you talk about a theme that sort of um, got to me, then I was uh, when I was 17, 18, learning Hebrew, doing industrial engineering, learning Hebrew, of course. Of course. You understand that? Yeah. Um, I, I, I started to translate uh, Psalms of David from the Bible. <laughs> I was more and more impressed with the understanding of what a soul is, what the flesh is, what the spirit is. And the Hebrew terms of that would be basar and nefesh and ruach. Mm. And uh, why do I use the Hebrew terms? Because if I do the same translations from the Greek, they mean different things. And if you then get into English or into Dutch, uh, you think that you know what you're talking about, but it's but but you have to sort of first really understand what is meant with those terms within a certain corpus of literature like the Psalms before you move on and and, and start to get to all kinds of conclusions. Later on, um, when, uh, when I went into Gnosticism, Gnostics are very strong on uh, what they would call uh, Soma, uh, psyche, psyche, soma, mm. psyche, and uh, pneuma, or pneuma, as the English would say. Mm -hmm. 
So those words would also have a meaning, and it's sort of in the middle between Greek thought that you could read in Plato or Aristotle and Christian Hebrew thought. So you would have to do your best to understand what they mean with it. But the same triple humanity comes back. It's very big in, in Gnosticism. And now when I do the work on economics with, uh, with, with Lance, I also went into biology and evolution. And basically it works very, very well to first look at those things that drive you um, as a organism that wants to move. The big thing, the big difference between um, between plants and animals is that the animals want to move, and wanting is a very important thing here. So the old Greeks would say that the, the appetite part is that which defines the soul. It wants to move. Yes, but what would the Hebrews say here? The, the Hebrews would uh, don't talk in this 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 um, schematic. Uh, you would read the Psalms and you would observe what the soul does. The soul rejoices, the soul is down, the soul is is encouraged, but the soul never speaks. So it's not the, the, the soul is not your rational thinking, which for the Greeks, it would be. The, the, the psyche includes the rational thinking, but it also includes that other stuff. So that, that would be interesting. But the point I wanted to make about the uh, evolution that we now use for economic decision making is you've got the body that actually looks at things that it needs to calm the body. You get hungry, you want to eat, you get sleepy, you want to rest, you get horny, well, et cetera. You understand where I'm going to. Uh, those are bodily states that drive part of your decisions. And then the second part would be when we become social mammals and our social feelings course correct something of the bodily state driven behavior so you don't start eating right away but you wait to see how the group starts to eat like wolves you need to hunt in a pack so you you cannot just go for your own self-interest immediately you have to regulate that drive that impulse through social feelings and animals have the same and that's when you get to that nefesh type thing. That's that's that part that doesn't speak. And then when you move into the human realm of being able to think about, you're actually doing what I just described about the kids. Um, you go into the spirit and you can be in a different person. That's empathy. Or you can be in a different situation. Or you can think about, I was addressing um, uh, some of the people in the room, two young people. They said, well, you can now go out and ask her to marry you, which... I asked is that whether that was out of bounds, and they said, no, no, you can, you, you can use the example. Okay, so I used the example. And then I said, what you'll do is you imagine how she will react, and then you will feel whether or not you like that reaction, or rather think, well, let's not do it here in Belgium, let's wait for Paris. So you, you're able to travel in the mind to different spaces, different times, and in different purses. Now, that unique human capability, there's no other species that has gone that far, would look very much like how we talk about spirit or how we talk about the noose in Greek. Mm. So yes, that tripartite thing comes back and back and back. And it's a very useful thing because it's, it, 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 it helps us to uh, respect the body, listen to your body, to respect your emotional system, understand how it works, how it's activated because it's activated in various different ways and also respect things like ideas ideals for ideologies ideally those would be aligned i presume the three well that's the fun thing if you can align those three if you can do something that's meaningful for you at the same time that it is socially um, uh, agreeable to you and it is bodily agreeable yeah then you're in the flow state wow that's a so nice flow state comes from because so, so what I did is so in the end I said well any action can produce material goods social goods and spiritual goods mm -hmm. and then I presented a picture of a grandma ba baking a cake with a granddaughter and I said well if I'm a pure economist I would say the cake costs about four euros in the supermarket the ingredients almost the same like say for, for just for argument's sake three fifty. Would you work 20 minutes on a cake that will only save you 50 cents? 
from a pure materialistic point of view, that's absolutely stupid. You shouldn't be doing that. You should maximize the number of goods that you can consume as a result of your disposable income, of course. Well, that's wrong. That's plain wrong. Yeah. We see the grandma actually baking a cake. So she's not behaving in the way that economics would predict that unless you take into account, and economists are, of course, able to do that as soon as they see reality for what it is. And then you can take into account that she enjoys baking the cake together with her grandchild or perhaps even baking it on her own and reliving the days that they did it, that she did it with her mother or father baking a cake so this this social good then comes into play which is far worth far more than the 50 cents but then even thinking about that this grandchild child may in the future be able to bake a cake with people that she loves for her family or for her children or grandchildren that makes this 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 grandmother a generative person who actually moves through the ages even beyond the temporal confines of her own existence after her death she lives on in the baking of the cake of her grandchild mm. who then passes that on so you in one act she produces material social and spiritual goods yeah that's beautiful it's beautiful it also brings me to the fact that it's very hard to put things into quantity in terms of of human endeavors let's say because if you simply look at the parts you you completely lose what else is there to find and it's it's kind of silly if you look at it in that way yeah. i think and this is also you know uh, why i'm so skeptical of modern economics it's it seems so limited and so mechanistic it misses the the human aspect so i'm glad you're working on that and the fun thing uh, lucas is the um uh, you can respect economics for being a focused enterprise. Let me try to explain that. You want to make a decision and you want to make the decision as good as possible. So you build a model. You say, what is irrelevant for this decision? Um, what's the goal function? So what do I want to achieve? What do I want to optimize? What's the model? And what's the information that I can gather? And then I can take the most rational decision. You think. But knowing that you're building a model means that you are simplifying reality. Yeah. Putting a goal function in there means that you think that you know what's best for you, but you may not. That was part of the dialogue on economics um, that Xenophon wrote in the 4th century BCE. Um, it's a Socratic dialogue. So Socrates is asking what is really good for you. Um, and then thinking that you have all the information correct is something of hubris as well. Especially if you think how difficult a product actually is, because we just discussed the product of baking a cake, how many different good things, goods are attached to it, material, spiritual, uh, social goods. So if you, if you then understand how many different options you should have to consider, if you want to do it purely rational, you get combinatorial explosion. You cannot, you, you cannot describe all the options. So a pure rational way is impossible, but nevertheless, it's a worthy endeavor. As long as you're humble enough to know that, that you're only scratching the surface of reality. Yeah. And to stay aware of that, I think that's the main thing that's, that's becoming problematic is that people forget that the map is not the territory. So Absolutely. the map itself is not, it's not useless, but you got to remember its function. And, absolutely yeah absolutely and the, one of the biggest problems is the hubris that we have now of materialist thinkers um that they think they understand reality and um well ba very basic example I, I was walking with a friend and i was crying at one stage in the conversation and he wanted me to say why i was crying and i said well if if, if i now tell you why i'm crying the reduction it's such a reduction because i don't know this tiny bit of myself yeah let me stay here for a while and then later on we'll talk about it and explore but but, but we we tend to do is immediately get a cause for a effect yeah i think that's that's it yeah that's not how the human being works it's not how reality works either i would no. say no that's uh it's very true and i think that it's a lot of unlearning now for a lot of us 
maybe less for you, but I think that people that grew up in this paradigm, they, I myself included, I still have the software, if you know what I mean. So even though I can intellectually understand all these things, um, still it's sometimes it's difficult. That's what you said to Karen Wong, huh? I remember that, yeah. The materialistic um, software. Yeah. <laughs> and I think um, you watched a lot of uh, Rick and Morty and stuff. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, sort of non-stop uh, watching all that stuff. Uh, I remember complaining that we took you to church and uh, because it was uh, indoctrinating, you said at the time. And I said, well, the indoctrination is one hour in the week and you are with Rick and Morty on your screen like say four hours now that's maybe too much but two hours a day so is nihilism not a far bigger indoctrination that you're getting now than that yeah. one hour i think that's the, it's one of the biggest fallacies for sure in the modern age we think we're objective like we really believe we're objective when we try to give like a liberal arts education all these things it's like you're you're taking a stance either way and it's choosing what stance that is and, and trying to figure out what the highest is. But I think that using ideology as your indoctrination is always going to be limiting and narrowing your view of reality, let's say. Whereas I do believe that a Christian worldview is more opening up to beauty and a religious worldview in, in general. Um, yeah. That's one other subject that we could touch at one point in time because spirituality is not confined to Christianity. No, of course not. Um, and Christianity is not just pure and good. I mean, there's a lot of rottenness in, in religion. Religion can be a... Well, basically, religion is a powerful tool, uh, but it can be used for good and for bad. And every every religion can be used for good and for bad, and no religion especially if it's ideological driven, uh, ideologically driven, can be used for good and bad also. So yeah, um, we have to be careful uh, about um, this, this, this tremendous power of the spirit that everyone has, that it is being used for good. Yeah. So you go to a Protestant church uh, yep. in your hometown which I guess a lot of people in the little corner would support that to say like, you just find a church, you marry the church. You don't, you have to take it for its faults. Let's say, mm -hmm. I think the opinions are a bit divided on that as well within this community where some would say, no, actually I don't like Protestantism. I'm going to jump to Orthodoxy or not at all. I go to a different um, religion and you already just, just alluded to the fact that you don't believe Christianity is the only um, religion. Could you tell us a bit about your views well, on let's that? Let's first do the Please. church bit then. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then later on, we can expand that. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So we went to South Africa um, early in our marriage, and we wanted to find the perfect church. Because you don't want to have a racist church. And South Africa was, of course, divided by racial lines and that, sort of influences the way that people think um and then we you want a church that has something that lives and that's uh that's welcoming that's fulfilling etc so you have we had a lot of different demands as almost as spiritual consumers and we went to different churches and we found out that there's something wrong with each and every one if you make these demands until you understand that you are the church. You have to co-produce what you value. Mm. You're just a consumer in church. So it's not a matter of choice. It is what you decide to produce as well as then what you can collectively consume. And we said, when we went back, we said, well, it's important that we ground ourselves, just be part of the community that you can find. And in our case, it's 400 meters from home. So that's very much grounded. And then, of course, we had huge problems because there were things that we didn't agree with or that we found not fulfilling. And then there was this couple, they've now died. Um, but they were sitting in front of the church. And when we would talk to them, they would always say something that they enjoyed. I was, 
humbling and inspiring at the same time. And I think that whatever you do, um, if you do it with that attitude, that you are co-producing something for the goods of others, for the good of others, um, and you do that in a humble spirit, you will make something beautiful. You will find something beautiful even in the ashes. And even in a rotten church, you can find something beautiful. Now, in general, there are th strengths and weaknesses about different churches. The, the Protestant church typically wants to meet God in the word. So in the narrative of the Bible, the teachings of the Bible. And if you are open to that, that could be a good place. You need a minister who is humble enough to actually facilitate that meeting in the word. But if that happens, that's kind of beautiful. Um, you have uh, the Catholic churches who are particularly good in creating the moment of uh, sharing the body of Christ together, the communion. Um, that's where they seek their, 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 that's where they commune not just with each other, but also with God. And I think there is some particular beauty in that. And then when you get to the Orthodox churches, they actually enjoy the mystery even more. They would do stuff behind the screen, just so you know that it's there, even if you can't see it. Um, and beauty plays a tremendous role in there. And it's a very old church, but it's not the church that, say, the first century Christians would go to. I mean, nobody can claim that, not even the Baptists who uh, think they do, but, well, no, I shouldn't say that. But the Baptist movement thought they could go back to the earliest Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that was simply a sort of a romanticism that that took place when uh, in the 16th century. Um, so you you, you uh, and but they would they would seek the moment in the moment of um, how should it, conversion. Mm. And then you've got, of course, the Pentecostals who would look for community with God in letting go in the spirit so that they would talk in tongues or see visions, etc. Uh, if you allow yourself, or, or we would go to African churches that yeah. would have ancestor spirits. Okay, I'm now getting something beyond Christianity <laughs> now, or you would go to Santeria on Cuba where, 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 where a priest told me how they do it there. Um, but if you are open to God, yeah, and you're confident that you that you're loved, and um, that He is able to um, reveal Himself in different ways. I think you can enjoy most churches. Hmm. All right, and you enjoy yours. Yes, although there are elements <laughs> that I find troublesome. <laughs> Specifically, um, that I think that it's the rationality of our church. We use songs that are pretty rational. We're not an evangelical church, so it's pretty rational songs. It means that you have to be, you have this cognition, this 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 um, uh, this propositional knowledge. If you uh, take the language of John Favakey, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of dominates. And you have to do a little bit extra to make it participatory knowledge. And how do you do that yourself? That's not difficult for us because we've we've been raised in this tradition. So we know how you can find it, where you meet God in the word and, 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 and how that uh, sort of moves you. But to to pass on that heritage to, to our children who are no longer uh, that much in that tradition. It has something to do with technology. It has something to do with changing society, etc. But I think it's pretty a pretty big challenge to, uh, to have this cognitive propositional almost, because it's more than that. Uh, uh, type of Christianity and pass that on well to your children, like you. I mean, you can tell us a little bit why you find it difficult to go to a uh, mainline Protestant church. 
Well, I think that because you say the propositional is highlighted so much, I think that that's one of the main reasons people desert the church so much, especially young people that are growing up within a scientific paradigm, let's say. Because oftentimes the church and its propositions, at least in the Protestant church that I grew up with, doesn't really have good answers to the scientific objections. And I also see, historically speaking, that a lot of times the church has uh, has bowed down to, to science in many different ways. Um, so I think, say, compared to the Orthodox church, which does not <laughs> bow down at all, and where I think the beliefs come forth from the ritual. So the beliefs come forth from the participation. So the the, the children, I, I have a Coptic Orthodox church near here, and everyone participates in the ceremonies. So you cannot get away with just sitting at Protestant church like I did, being on my phone or making Sudokus or something and just not not or carving your favorite soccer team into the woodwork uh, in front of you let's not talk about that but <laughs> <laughs> i actually i went to those seats where you sat up there and i saw and i knew it was you because we share the love of a soccer team that is not very popular here in uh, the middle of the netherlands and it was all over the place and i thought well this 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 is the lion's den this is where lucas laid down and uh, wrote down uh, his most innermost thoughts uh. yeah <laughs> no, i saw one work. i saw one carving of the opposite team the rival team really small so that made me really angry so i <laughs> well allegedly i did um, <laughs> no but i was going to say that by virtue of of these children participating in the ritual they they experience something and yes. I believe and you believe that that something is extremely real. And and that's where their belief comes from. And they're like, oh, wait, this is actually something. There's actually something here. Whereas yeah. if if you don't have the, the religious receptivity or the, the motivation to feel anything, you're not going to feel much of anything in the Protestant church unless you're an anomaly. Or unless you are um, initiated yeah. into what's behind it. Yeah. And and that requires in a Protestant church catechism. It requires uh, Bible study, etc. And if if you're not ready to engage with that, then it's difficult. Let's let's be Extremely honest. Extremely so. Extremely so. Yes. So I think it's kind of a miracle that some children don't desert that church in this day and age, um, for the reasons I mentioned. And like I say very often, the pop culture is so counter christian that it's kind of a miracle that there are people that are still believing in in god and uh, practicing that um so yeah that's what i would say about it and that's also why i'm a bit more picky let's say with going to a, a church um, and picking the right church let's say which maybe is not very good terminology but nowadays we've come at a time where we are at a spiritual meaning crisis let's say and a lot of us do think that the answers can also lie within Christianity, especially if you're a Western person, because I think we have to face reality in saying that it's extremely difficult to find a spiritual home in a religion that is that is not grounded within the West. I do believe it's possible, but it's very difficult. So I think there is a tremendous responsibility for, for young people as well to, to figure this out. Um, which actually brings me to my next question, because there are certain people in this space, um, one of which is Wolfgang Smith, who believe that the splinterings of the church will eventually go back to one church that will be more centered around the mystical aspects, the, the ritual, let's say, and thus made more acceptable, um, accessible for people do you see this as a possibility at all in the future how do you or have you given this any thought at all or do you think it's going to remain more splintered like it is now well truth is if you look at the numbers around the world that scenario is not playing out no so you would have to have a certain vision and faith as to why um such a movement would come into play. For instance, if Christianity becomes smaller, becomes a minority 
in in the West, uh, you can imagine that uh, there would be some kind of recognition across church boundaries. So I don't have a problem. Most people don't have a problem that Catholics and Protestants are really brothers and sisters or Orthodox people. Like, like we're now talking about the Orthodox Church and the Protestant Church without feeling that you would go to a different religion. I mean, that's oh. I think that's quite clear. Um, nevertheless, if you look at early Christianity, which is my field of expertise, uh, there were considerable differences. So there is a tendency of people to, um, especially in this process, I mean, you, you find out who God is for you. Huh? So there's not just a body of teaching that is being passed on to you. There is something that you need to participate in and that you will put to, um, that your thoughts will try to, to wrestle with. And as you have different personalities and you have different backgrounds and different histories, people will come and describe it in different terms. Yeah. Not much wrong with that. No. So I guess this diversity will also be a central place. And if he talks about mysticism, um, yes, I do believe that uh, for me, that is the, the core of my faith. It's a mystic presence. Um, as I said, being in heaven and on earth at the same time is is, is a joy. Mm. It's, 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 it's weird beyond reason. Yeah. It takes away a lot of the Christmas man type of religion. Eh? Do ut des, as the Greeks would say, I offer to God in order to get something back in return. Yeah. That's out of the question if you go into a mystic relationship with, uh, with God. But we should also acknowledge that most of our, let, let's go back to this evolutionary model, spiritual goods, um, a lot of our goods are social goods. So we go to a church because our friends go to that church. And it's sort of, we make more friends there. And it sort of reinforces itself. And we do good things together. So we build a social relationship as well, even though those friends may be uh, differently inclined in their, in their personality or their background or their history and may make different slightly different choices then we nevertheless share something and then there's of course the, the tiny little problem that the, the internet may try to evade that's the embodiment well, it's not all virtual so you would look for something in a neighborhood yeah <laughs> you may yeah. also look for something on the internet and get into the little corner and then you find out well that satisfies part of what i want but it still makes sense to 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 especially if you come become a producer of religious experience that you would be there to give someone a cup of soup if they're sick or what have you. Yeah. That embodiment is important as well. So I think that there will remain a lot of diversity. Yeah, I think that's also more realistic. I think it I'm not sure how I must understand, how I can understand um, the idea of one unified church. I think it's quite um, it's quite a mystical idea on its own. Um, and he gets this from yeah. Go ahead. He gets this from Malachi Martin. He's a big man in. He was a big man in Catholicism. He wrote a lot of books. I don't know where it comes from, but I thought maybe you would have something enlightening to say about it. But I think what you're saying is quite realistic and maybe the timeline is just a lot different as well. Well, let's, let's be a little less realistic for a while and let's yeah. talk about the promised land. Yeah, something like One that. One of the things that spiritual goods produce is the desire of something better than what we have today. Yeah. So the desire, I would say, uh, it is a course correcting the desire for the unity of the church is a course correcting desire to uh, to correct a little bit the splintering of the church because of lower reasons like i don't get along with you so i start my own church type of reasoning <laughs> yeah it's much like I the think uh, that in the dy dynamic between yeah. those two forces uh, that's where we live. That is where reality is. That is the yin and yang stuff. And then we could get to Eastern religions and stuff like that. But, but that's that within that dynamic, we exist and, and we need that desire. We need that longing for something that's better. Yeah. You need an ideal. 
yes to work toward yeah and i guess in a way that ideal is also real it's something uh i mean it's almost how you conceptualize christ sometimes you know yes it's the symbolic ideal of the good okay that's uh that's extremely enlightening i don't know how much time you have left if you want to uh, um well, well we can leave it here we can leave now. it here for today that yeah. sounds very good always learning a lot with you glad to uh to finally record it and now we can uh, record much more and um yeah wish everyone that's that such watched a, huh? such a privilege to have you like this lucas uh, i know you're you're questioning me my questions to you would be as manifold as the ones that you have but you're in charge here <laughs> for today <laughs> really for today enjoy what you're doing <laughs> we have lots of plans for the future so uh there will be a lot more content i think coming from uh from me my father and eventually my brother hopefully at least those are some of the ideas we have uh, cooking up and i think uh it's very meaningful because there's a lot of responsibility i believe um so it's very exciting thank you for your time today we'll see you Thank soon you, and i can actually right. say i love you on um, a podcast <laughs> yes sir <laughs> all right have a good one bye-bye